that entrepreneurs who had really rich parents, who had the financial resources, who had the network, and there were entrepreneurs that just made, made it from nowhere. But you're hard pressed to find entrepreneurs who would make it from somewhere in the middle. They have something to lose. Because if you see somebody who's really rich, they don't have much to lose, right? They can take a few cracks at the game. And somebody who doesn't have much, they're also playing like they have nothing to lose, right? So it's like you have to get into this attitude where, you know, failure isn't, doesn't matter to you. It isn't relevant to you. You know, if, you, if you're going to ask me about my life story, it's, it's very simple, right? I didn't have... Uh, I didn't have too much spatial awareness till I got my first computer, which was the age of seven. My mom gifted me a computer. It's a comp co it was a compact Rosario. There was this time in most people's lives, especially people who are between the ages of 20 to 30 right now, where it was just their parents and their relatives who just kept speaking to them, right? Do this, do that. And you had one set of voices. But because I had a computer, I had the internet, and I had a bunch of different forums that I used to visit, and I'm not talking about social media, right? I think social media is algorithmic, what the content you get. Back then, it wasn't very simplistic. So I heard many different voices, right? People who were successful on the Google message boards, people who were uh, successful on different channels, right? So there, we had small mini sites like GeoCities at that point. And <clears throat> what I heard was very simple, right? What I heard was, dude, if you want to make money, you have to sell something that people want, right? And if you build something that people want and you're able to sell it, then you will make money. Whereas with my parents and my relatives and the people around me, the story was different. It was completely different. The story was, you need to go get a degree, get a job, you know, probably go abroad for a further degree and then come back. So I was like, I was caught in two minds. I was like, should I do this or should I do this? And then at some point I started realizing, hey, you know, I need to put my content out there, right? So first I used to play a lot of games. I think that's what introduced me to this entire world. And as I played a lot of games at that point, um, I slowly started saying, okay, I'll put up videos of this game, right? Can I put this up on YouTube? And I put it up on YouTube. I had this entire series. Uh, it was a series about a game called Dota. It was called Rise of the Noobs, right? It was basically about how people screw up at the game. And before you knew it, the channel, you know, we had like 400,000 views or something, which was big at that point, right? When I was like 15 or 16. And as more and more people started consuming that content and as I started getting feedback, I was like, okay, I should do more of this. So I've realized that what people do more of is what they get positive feedback for, right? From their social circle. And for me, my social circle was those YouTube comments, right? And it's not, it wasn't toxic like it is today. It was very, very good at that point because very few people had access and very few people even cared about the internet at that point. You know, then slowly, you know, the real world hit when my mom was like, you have to go into college. You have to study for IITs. And this is a famous story, right? Where I went to the IITs, the entrance exam, and I just, I don't know what to do. Right? Because I hadn't studied, wasn't interesting, and I didn't have the social kind of feedback. That was not my goal, right? And I wasn't judged or I, I couldn't care about it. And I remember going for another entrance exam. And I just, after an hour, it was a three hour online test. And after an hour, I was just like, I need to leave. I have a stomach ache. And they wouldn't let me leave. They're like, no, you have to sit for three hours. And I was like, but I know I'm not getting in. Like, why are we wasting this time? They're like, no, you've paid for the entrance test. You have to sit there. I was like, exactly, I've paid for it. I get the opportunity to do what I want to. So, you know, then because I didn't get in, I ended up getting in into Manipal Institute of Technology. You know, I think I put some financial pressure on my parents at that point because I was like, you know, I need to go to this college because there's no other college that I can get into, you know. So I got into MIT, Manipal, and straight up I knew, okay, this is a different environment, right? This is probably not an environment I would gel in. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and study. So in the first year of college, you know, I gathered a bunch of people and I said, guys, can we, can we build a company? I don't want to build a company. And they said, sure, let's, let's build a company. And uh, we didn't know what we were going to do. So we said, okay, we'll sell t-shirts because t-shirts were the rage back then. And our difference, our kind of pitch was, we will put people's names on the back, right? We'll make it personalized. And unfortunately or fortunately, the first batch of t-shirts that came in was completely screwed up. All the paint was leaking. There were many types of ways to do t-shirt printing. And one of the ways is rubber printing. And the rubber was leaking on the back of the t-shirts. So all of us pulled in some cash. We went and ordered another batch of t-shirts from a different supplier. I remember taking a bus to Tirupur one day before my exams, just getting it done. I remember the exam the next day was EG, which is engineering graphics, which is, you know, you draw stuff. I remember I was so groggy during the exam because I had just come back 
from a bus from Tirupur. But in Tirupur, you know, I, I met many different suppliers. I realized that, you know, if I bought the same t-shirts in Manipal, it cost me 300 or 400 rupees, but here it's like 100, 150 rupees. I started making these indirect associations. I was like, this guy cares about what he's doing, which is why his stuff is good. This guy doesn't care about what he's doing, so his stuff is average. This guy just wants to make a quick buck, his stuff is the worst, right? So, and, and the people who really care, obviously, they're, they're a little more expensive. So we went with a slightly expensive option. You know, we, I mean, even when I print t-shirts today, I print from the same guy. He's still around, right? Six, seven years later. By the end of the year, we had sold almost 5,000 t-shirts. We made, you know, we started realizing that custom making t-shirts is not scalable. You have to put in a lot of effort. So we started making generic t-shirts. And, you know, Nikita, who still works with me today, she, I remember she just, you know, she walked to every um, room in the hostels. She knocked on the door and she said, guys, this is a t-shirt, you have to buy it. Do you want small, medium or large, right? So we've been in the business of sales for a very long time. It's, it's in our DNA. Um, and that's when e-commerce was still starting in India. So I remember going to East Parks, which was a very old conference. I was listening to somebody from Flipkart, <coughs> Mikin Maheshwari, and he was, he was talking about Flipkart's own journey, right? And it seemed like their roots were as humble as our roots, right? They also started out very, very, in a very, very small way, right, with books. And I said, hey, is it true that every entrepreneur starts from like a small place? And then I realized, I, I started reading a little bit about history. I started reading about other entrepreneurs and where they all started from. And I re realized that there are two kinds of people, right? There, there are entrepreneurs who had really rich parents, who had the financial resources, who had the network. And there are entrepreneurs that just made, made it from nowhere. But you're hard pressed to find entrepreneurs who would make it from somewhere in the middle. They have something to lose. Because if you see somebody who's really rich, they don't have much to lose, right? They can take a few cracks at the game. And somebody who doesn't have much, they're also playing like they have nothing to lose, right? So it's like you have to get into this attitude where, you know, failure isn't, doesn't matter to you. It isn't relevant to you. So, and I feel like that's a, that's a lot to do with social circle because the people that I brought along with me to, to run this, whether I knew it or not, I was picking out people who couldn't care less about failure. Who were like, if this screws up, cool, we'll do something else. And, you know, we did something else. After we did t-shirts, we started doing web design, right? Because we w went on Upwork, we started doing some freelance, we got different projects. Compared to t-shirts where we made money, here I was making money without leaving, without leaving my room. And I was like, this I can do, this is nice. Because t-shirts are a lot of effort. You have to be at every door. You have to really push people to, to, to buy. It's very unscalable. And, and that's what happened, right? We, we started doing this web design stuff. We started doing UI UX. Before you knew we were building $150 an hour, like in a year, in a year and a half. And it was a very wasteful life because, because I was a kid, right? And I would say, okay, I'll, I'll go to this five-star hotel. I'd work one hour and I'd stay the entire day there. And then I'd eat something and then I'd scoot, I'd leave. And I was like, I did that for a few weeks and I was like, this is boring. And that, that's the point where I was just like, okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a risk. So I got the same team together We've been working for three, four years at that point. And I said, guys, let's, let's start a proper company. Let's take a risk. If you want to take a big risk, you have to burn all your bridges. You have to have no options, right? If you have any backup option, you'll take it. That's how it is, right? So we had no option. We moved to uh, Delhi. I'd never been to Delhi in zero degree temperature without sweaters. And we stayed in Delhi. We built a company called Jobspire. We did this in the eighth semester of college. We were supposed to do an internship. So we passed off this thing as an internship. And, you know, we, we did this all in a small, like very, very small apartment. And, you know, the apartment was a three BHK, but you do not know how small it was. It was like the rooms were, were half, like, you know, the distance between you and me and maybe a little more, right? And the bathrooms were terrible because that's the only thing we could afford. We were doing it from our own pocket, right? We, we were like, okay, we're all going to put in this much money. It's going to last us for a year. So we were doing our own math. And, and that's the point where, you know, I realized that when you, when you have no choice but to do something, you pull it off, right? When your back's against the wall, and I've, my back's been against the wall many, many, many times, right? We scaled that platform to uh, almost 4 million requests in 2016, moved back to Bangalore, hired a bigger team, became 30 employees, beautiful office in, in Al-Sur. Um, you know, 2000, early 2017, sold it off to a New York-based company after courting two or three companies. And essentially, we, I sold it because I was just like, you know, I don't want to spend my entire life doing recruitment, right? Because we were working with the best companies. The, we were working with the Ubers, we were working with the Swiggies, we had, you know, 150,000 applicants, probably more than that. And it's just like, then what? Right, I wanna work on something bigger. 
And that's when I started Avalon. And my focus with Avalon was very, very, very simple. I was just like, I have no idea what I'm going to do, but I want this company, which is a vehicle for everything I do. In fact, my first co-founder, the person I found for Avalon, you know, he was a tech guy. Uh, he quit in like a week. He was just like, there's no focus for this company, right? What are you guys going to do? And I was like, hang on, we'll, we'll figure it out. And he's just like, that's not how it works. So, so he left and then I, I had no options. And then I found Shashank, right? I found Shashank and I found another gentleman named Abhinav, different Abhinav, right? Abhinav Arora. I swear to God, the first year of Avalon was purely like, it, it was like we were running this laboratory, right? So we were doing everything and anything required to build a bank, right? So I funded the first six months of the company. Um, we, what we did was we were like, okay, we will go out and we will find clients. We will sell software services first to build a bank. And maybe we'll sell marketing services too. So, you know, we went out, we reached out to a lot of people. I, I knew a lot of sales, so, and I, I had a decent network. So I spoke to a lot of people and I said, I need a project, I need a project. And that's all I spoke about. And then I got the projects and then we hired people. And then slowly the bank built and it built a lot faster than we thought it would, right? And before we knew it, we were, we, we had like seven, eight different clients, big ones. And we got our first Fortune 500 clients, the big contract. We scaled from zero to almost 50 people. Um, you know, and then we started investing. We realized that, look, as a services company, if we're just doing consultation and we're you know, doing marketing and writing code for other people, we can, we can make X amount of money with 50 employees. We can make 2X the amount of money with 100 employees. It's linear, right? It's very linear. So we said, okay, let's start investing, right? Let's, uh, let's take some risks. Let's invest in some product companies because the only way you will make money, and this is a message to anybody watching this, if you want to have a stable life, you can have a salary, but there are problems with that too. But if you want to get rich, you need equity. You need pieces of companies, right? You need pieces of companies and there's no other way to put this, right? So, so I started investing in, uh, you know, companies. We, I mean, Avalon started investing. We started off, you know, putting in very small amounts of money. We said we'll put in 30 lakhs, plus we'll do some code coding for you. Uh, we'll, we'll probably build your backend, right? Or we'll run some ads for you whatever, wherever you think we can add value. And then slowly that check went up from 30 lakhs to a crore. It went from a crore to, you know, in Foxbound's case, which is our most expensive product, two crores. And you can see some of our investments, the MANA network, which has, which runs the bar episodes, which just had 1,400 people. They sold out the, like, Ubicity, which is like impossible, nearly impossible to do, right? So same skills, same advertising skills from Avalon, comes into selling out tickets for an events company. And the reason we built an events company, being very honest, is leverage, right? We're just doing it for leverage. If we make money off it, that's great. But like I said, Avalon is about putting in a lot of leverage. Foxbound is a sales automation tool. It helps us get new projects very easily. That's the idea. And, you know, then we just scaled, man. I mean, now we're in a very comfortable place in terms of how we're a profitable company. We don't answer to anybody. When, when we started you know, doing really well with Avalon and we started investing in different companies, that's when we started realizing that, hey, maybe the education system is screwed up. That's what Meta Startup taught us, the My YouTube thing is taught us, which is, we don't, we're not teaching people that there is risk in the world. We are convincing people that there's no risk in the world. Like college is like, oh, you study this, you get a job. And that's bullshit, right? Because it's a supply demand thing. If everybody becomes a data scientist today and this, I think colleges are be, like, they, they don't know what they're doing, right? If everybody becomes a data scientist today, simple economics will tell you that some of them will get hired, probably the most visible ones, not the best ones, the most visible ones, the ones with the biggest brand, and the rest are just gonna be left out on the streets. There has been very, very few instances where you have gotten successful doing what the herd has done, right? When you do what the herd has done, you avoid the social pressure of being told, hey, you're wrong, that's it, right? And I was told I was wrong many, many times when I was younger, right? Even now, sometimes I'm told, why are you running multiple companies? I'm like, wait and watch. This is not multiple companies. It's all one company. It's really dependent on how you see it, right? And that's why I don't bother explaining it. But when another person, you know, comes in or a group comes in, and that's, that's one of the reasons I don't like co-working spaces, right? If I'm sitting here at a co-working space and I have five other people and I have a crazy idea and often, you know, most ideas are crazy. So if you go in as a founder with an absolutely crazy idea and there are five other people in the room and they tell you, hey, that's not gonna work, that's a stupid idea, you're more likely to shelf it. Right? Because we're social creatures, right? And a lot of why I come up with crazy ideas is because I spend a lot of time with myself, right? And now I spend a lot of time with Shashank and Abhinav and you know, all these people here. I spend time with people who are as delusional as I am, right? Who are as open to experimenting as I am. And that's when we realized, right? That's the labs part of our name. A lot of trial and error. 
Avalon is about, we do a lot of trial and error. You know, people outside don't see it, but the amount of experiments we've run, very few people can even fathom it in the last two, two and a half years. Because we've taken the experiment of running ads and scaling it in many different situations, I can sell out an event like this. I don't need anybody's help to do it. I can probably, you know, if, if I'm writing a book, I can make a bestseller like this. And I've done it. Like, you can see that it's the same patterns, whether it's the book, whether it's, you know, the events, whether it's, you know, the SaaS software that we sell, it's the same thing, right? So that's it. It's just about learning those things and people don't have that ability, right? So I think college should be about teaching people that there is risk in the world and we are not going to teach, tell you that there's no risk in the world. We're going to tell you how to get back if you fall and how to learn your own critical thinking skills, which is hard to teach, right? Risk management is hard to teach because you don't learn it when you're not under risk. It's like swimming, right? It's like teaching you about a pool, but if you're never going to dive in, you're never going to learn about it. So yeah, so that's it. That's my story. And now we're moving to education. We made a big investment in the Meta platform. It's going to be free. Uh, we're going to teach everything from scratch. We're going to assume you guys don't know anything. And we're going to just teach you all the way from scratch while telling you that, look, this is not you're not going to become a graphic designer by going through the design course, right? You're going to learn a graphic design skill. How you use it is up to you. The skills are all we teach you. We're not saying this is the career map. That, that's silly. And, and you know, I, I, I have this, I think that AI is getting really smart. People don't see it because I follow open AI a lot. And uh, as AI gets smarter, it's, I don't know what humans are going to be doing, right? So I spend a lot of my th time thinking about, okay, what do I sell them? Are, if, if there's a few people that are making all the money, if it's just the Amazons, the Microsofts and the Facebook, because see, today you need, why, do, why, do, why does an Amazon need people? To deliver stuff, to write their code, to come up with new ideas, to build stuff. But what if Amazon just realizes that, you know, there's this AI now that can build software for you and it's coming soon, right? With reinforcement learning, it's coming soon. There are drones that can deliver stuff. Amazon doesn't need the people, right? And you might think Amazon needs the people and, you know, there's this human element of having those people. They don't. Humans are very, very difficult to work with, especially when you employ them, right? Because they want the freedom, they want all of that, but you can't give them all of that. It's, it's hard because you also, like your customers are going to abuse you if you give your delivery guy all the freedom in the world. So at that point, you know, it's just a bunch of these really big companies who can build software at will, who can use, you know, robots to deliver stuff, to do, you know, arbitrary human things, narrow things, and just a few people at the top to come up with good ideas. In that situation, how do you make money? Because any kind of business you have, Amazon or Microsoft is going to be doing it. And they're already getting to every business, right? Avalon's getting to every business. What do you do then? Right? And that's what's keeping me up because I'm like, then the concept of money, it's, it's a story that holds us all together. That falls. And if that falls, then what? And I also think that at that point, jobs will be pointless, right? So, so I'm trying to prepare people for a future where whether AI is, you know, becomes very narrow and becomes very good at one thing or AI is able to create a lot of things, I want you to be viable, right? So I'm going to teach you a battery of different things so you can learn how to combine it better. The interactions between say design and code, you can play on that edge because that's going to take AI some time. So I can buy you 20 years or I can buy you 15 years. And that's my goal. Beyond that, nobody knows. Nobody can see. My vantage point ends there. So guys and girls, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for, you know, spending 10, 15, 20, I don't know how long we went on for. So if you have any questions and, you know, if you want to interact, leave some comments down below and I'll see if I get the time. I don't know if I get the time. I'm not going to commit to anything, but I'd love to reply to some of them. Right. And if you want to know more about Avalon, there's avalonlabs.co. If you want to know more about me, there's varunmaya.com. And at the end of the day, if you learn to get smacked to the floor enough, and, and I used to be a very arrogant entrepreneur, right, when I started out. And the best cure to arrogance is to get absolutely crushed by the market. Right? You go out, say this idea is definitely going to work. And then what the market will do to you, the first time, it happens to most first-time entrepreneurs, it'll beat you down. And then while you're down, it'll club you in the head just a couple of times just to make sure. And then it'll pick you up and just to make sure it'll break every bone in your body and send you back. And true entrepreneurs are guys who pick themselves up after that. Right, so the only way you learn is to actually go to the market and get beaten up. Unfortunately, it's just how it is. It's a good thing because it prevents a lot of other people from being entrepreneurs. They can claim they're entrepreneurs, but the market decides, right, at the end of the day. So I'd love, so don't, don't time yourself. Don't say, oh, you know, I need to, I need to do it by a certain age. You know, I've been beaten by the market a couple of times, but I started early. But most people, they get beaten by the market the first time in their 30s. So even if you're a little older, a little younger, don't worry about it and understand that failure is a part of success. It's the same thing. It's just, it's just, 
continuation of the same thing. So happy to hear some of your thoughts, you know, uh, leave some comments down below and you know where to find us and yeah, like and share. Bye-bye.